Good evening. I, um, I got this book a while back, and I thought that tonight we're gonna get started with the first chapter, which is more of a question, or it tries to answer a question, and that question is, what is history? And I haven't read all of it, uh, but it seems like it's about how our perception of history is formed and what goes into creating our view of the past and how to judge it, how to try to, like, is there an objective way of viewing the past or will it always be, you know, not tainted, um, looking for a better word, um, colored by our experiences in the present, you know? So, yeah, let's, um, let's get started. What is history? History is not the same as the past. We can never directly experience the past. We can never know how it felt to be a gladiator fighting in the Colosseum of ancient Rome, or exactly what Napoleon had in mind when he decided to invade Russia in 1812. What actually happened in the past is gone. History is our attempt to reconstruct the past from the evidence that remains. The word history, while commonly taken to mean everything that has happened up until now, has its roots in the Greek word historain, meaning to find out by inquiry. The same root gives us the word story. We could say then that history is our inquiry into the story of the human race. History and fact. History is something very distinct from facts. Historians ask not only what happened, but also why did it happen? How did it happen? And what were the consequences? And use the answers to forge the links in chains of events, creating a continuous narrative. These are the kinds of inquiries that historians make, and from their conclusions, the past, for most of us, becomes a much more comprehensible place. Even today, however, there are cultures that do not concern themselves with recording history in the conventional sense, that is, as a chronological narrative that aims to represent what actually happened in the past. Many indigenous peoples, especially those with a strong oral tradition, Instead, weave together events of the distant and recent past in both mythological and actual happenings. The result is a body of knowledge that is relevant to that culture, which is passed down through the generations via storytelling and ritual. Whether oral or written, history is always an incomplete puzzle made up of fragments, hints, and selections from the evidence that is available. See the picture here. Passing on stories is a vital part of the oral culture of peoples such as the San of Namibia. Historical sources. The ingredients from which historians construct history are their sources. These may range from the types of pollen found in an ancient Near Eastern site revealing which crops once grew there, to a charter recording a land sale in medieval France, the writings of a historian living in ancient Rome, or the oral testimony of a World War II soldier. And uh, there's a quote here. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. By L.P. Hartley, The Go Between, 1955. Sources are themselves subdivided into those that are primary and those that are secondary. 
A primary source is something produced or written at the time. The writings of the Latin author Tacitus about 1st century CE Rome say while a secondary source is something written about is something written after the event itself, making use of primary sources. The distinction between the two may not always be clear, of course. For example, Niccolò Machiavelli's 16th century study of Roman history is a secondary source about Rome, but the obvious influence on his writing of his own view of the world gives us a primary source into life and attitudes in Renaissance, Renaissance Italy. In some eras, particularly the very ancient past before writing existed, there are no primary sources at all in the conventional sense. Here, archaeology, the study of bones, buildings, and artifacts recovered from past societies must help out. History can be written from many different viewpoints. A 19th century European writing shortly after the French Revolution is likely to have very different interests from a Chinese bureaucrat living in the 2nd century BCE or a 10th century Muslim traveler. Moreover, the interpretation of facts is always open to dispute and historians often disagree about how one fact is linked with another. Throughout history itself, we see evidence of different ideas about the same events. The perspective of chroniclers, chron, chron, chroniclers, it's a bit of a tongue twister, Cr chroniclers, <laughs> sorry about that, anyway, <laughs> such as the French scholar Geoffrey of Villarduin, traveled with the Christian forces on the Fourth Crusade is very different from that of his contemporary on the opposite, on the opposing side. The Arab historian Ibn al-Atir. Inevitably, we are all prone to adjusting history according to our own prejudices and beliefs, but for most, at its simplest, history answers a very human desire for order. Names for eras and ages, the classical world, the medieval world, and so on, and for movements and cultures may not necessarily have been used at the time, but today they serve to break down the past and its interpretation into convenient and digestible blocks, making history accessible for all. The era before humankind invented writing is called prehistory, and our knowledge of this time relies largely upon the skill of archaeologists. Once early societies developed scripts, they left not only artifacts, but also written evidence from which their history could be deciphered. Fascination with the far distant past is not a new phenomenon. In 81 BC, the Roman general Sertorius had his men dig up a skeleton in North Africa, doubtless that of a dinosaur, but which he decided were the bones of the giant Tingi, Tingi um, the traditional founder of the local town. However, it was not until the 19th century when a fierce debate erupted over whether humanity had descended from apes, fueled by Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man, that the greatest advances in the study of the ancient world were made. Inspired by Darwin's theories, the Dutch scholar Eugene Dubois set out to find an early ancestor of humankind, and in 1891 unearthed the remains of Pithecanthropus erectus, or Solo Man, later called Homo erectus, in Java in Indonesia. Dubois' 20th century successors, such as Richard and Louis, Louis Leakey, working in East Africa's Rift Valley, have since discovered remains that shed valuable light on humanity's physical evolution into its modern form. First Civilizations European scholars and archaeologists of the 19th and early 20th centuries became fascinated by the remote past, and in particular, the rise and fall of ancient empires. This was, after all, an age of empire for Europe, and the wealthy traveled abroad as part of their education. On the Grand Tour, as it was called, on the Grand Tour, as it was called, they inspected the ruins of classical cities such as Athens and Rome, 
but soon the older civilizations of the Near East drew attention. Scholars began to uncover evidence that revealed previously little-known cultures, or shed dramatic new light on more familiar ones. For example, in a single decade, the 1920s, uh, Leonard Woolley excavated the early Sumerian city at Ur. Ur, Ur, I'm not sure. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Sir John Marshall began the first consistent study of the Indus Valley civilization with his dickset, Mohenjo-daro, and Sir, Sir Arthur Evans' work at Nossos revealed the Minoan civilization. Written clues. The first steps to decipher Sumerian cuneiform script were also taken in the 1920s. While paintings, carvings, and other early art forms all reveal something of the ancient world, the most illuminating records were left once writing had been invented in around the mid-fourth millennium BCE. The earliest pieces of written evidence dating to before around 3000 BCE were not narratives about life at the time, but lists and rosters on practical matters. Cuneiform records of merchants, stocks from Samaria, and royal archives from Assyria. Hieroglyphic tomb inscriptions. Hierog hieroglyphic tomb inscriptions that identify the, the Egyptian dead may not provide us with stories, but give us a lot of information about how ancient peoples lived. Myth and tradition. Perhaps the most colorful insights into the ancient world are preserved in myth and tradition. Some of the earliest stories to be told by early societies relate to the origins of their race or its legendary heroes. Aztec tales of their wanderings before settling at Tenoch Tenochtitlan. I'm, excuse me for that pronunciation. That was that was not very good. <laughs> Well, for example, or the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, few have survived so intact as the, as the traditions in the Old Testament of the Bible. Stories such as the exodus of the Jews from persecution in Egypt and their subsequent con conquest of Palestine doubtless reflect the chaotic migrations and political instability of the Near East in the late second millennium BCE. The purpose of these accounts was primarily cultural or religious, and the task of relating the stories within them to precise historical events is not easy. Something that, um, that I've known about for quite a while, but that always kind of strikes me as well, it surprises me when I'm reminded of it that um, I was reminded by this picture here uh, that our knowledge of ancient Egypt is not it's very recent if you look like throughout history um, I just like I don't know, before I started reading more history, I always thought that that was like, you have this, or at least I did, this view that, you know, the more ancient a civilization, obviously, the longer we have known about them, right? Uh, which is kind of, I mean, there are this flawed thinking, but... Like, I'm, I'm often surprised by how recent some discoveries are. It's not only Egypt, like, they mentioned a dinosaur, uh, like a dinosaur here, and that too is also surprisingly recent, which is, I find it very fascinating that, you know, most of, when you think that 
most people who have ever lived did so lacking the knowledge of like these historically very important like events peoples or like dinosaurs like i find it yeah it's quite fascinating but uh, yeah let's continue the first historians it was in ancient greece that historical inquiry first arose it was in ancient greece the first historians it was in ancient greece that historical inquiry first arose perhaps inspired by the questioning spirit of the age that also produced the world's first philosophers in the new empires of rome and china scholars were prompted to investigate their people's rise to greatness the classical era has left us some of the finest literature and most majestic architecture ever produced the, le the latter embellished with statues and inscriptions that provide crucial evidence for the power and extent of empires their social structures and rituals of the time but even seemingly trivial finds give us clues about the minutiae minutiae of daily life for example the discovery at a watchtower in southwest germany of a shoehorn showed that the romans wore sandals close at the back whereas previously they were believed to have been open however it is not only through art and artifacts that we can understand the classical world from around the 5th century bce appear the first writers whom we can call historians the Greeks, known as the father of history, the Greek scholar Herod Herodotus, traveled widely throughout the Aegean and Near East in search of the raw material for his histories. What makes Herodotus exceptional is that he was the first chronicler of the past to state openly that he intended to discover the reasons behind events rather than simply recording the events themselves. A generation later, Th Thucydides, 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 oh, that was a, excuse me for that one. <laughs> 14, 460 to uh, 411 BC in his history of the Peloponnesian War recounts the conflict between Athens and Sparta. He gives incredibly lengthy accounts of the political and military maneuvers of each side, and his attention to detail and careful narrative were to become a model for many histories in the centuries to come. The Romans. By the early centuries BCE, Rome, the Mediterranean's new imperial power, was inspiring histories of its own. Scholars such as Livy, Livi, uh, 59 BC to 17 CE, and Tacitus, 55, 55 to 120 CE, analyzed the reasons for their city's power and the start of its perceived decline. In the view of Tacitus, the effect of imperial rule had been to undermine the moral fabric of the state. Roman historians were also not averse to uh, purveying gossip about their emperors, such as the salacious details of imperial habits that appear in Suetonius, um, Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars. More akin to the military histories of today is Julius Caesar's The Gallic Wars, an account of the conquest of Gaul in which Caesar was the commanding general a history that also served to glorify Caesar's reputation and promote his political career. From Pliny the Younger, we have a graphic descriptions, a graphic description of the eruption of Mount, Mount Vesuvius in southern Italy in 79 CE, which destroyed the city of Pompeii and killed his uncle, the naturalist Pliny the Elder. Although Pliny's description is almost scientific in its precision, giving no role to supernatural forces, other Romans believe that such events were caused by the anger of the gods 
this was not merely common superstition. As late as the 4th century CE, even educated Roman senators sacrificed at the altar of victory in the Senate House, believing that abandoning the old ways might cause their city's ruin. Other classical cultures also produced histories, entirely separate from the Greco-Roman tradition that began with Herodotus. From China, in particular, much has survived from this period. There are accounts as early as 753 BC of official scribes at the court of Jin, Jin um, tasked with compiling records of significant events, and a set of such annals covering the period uh, 722 to 481 BC in the state of Lu has survived. Perhaps the most famous Chinese historian, Sima Jian, the son of the official astrologer at the court of the Han emperors, composed the uh, Shiji uh, records of the historians, the first attempt to compile a complete history of China from ancient times. Falling out of favor with the emperor, he was sentenced to castration. But rather than committing suicide, the expected outcome of such a sentence, Sima Qian accepted his punishment. An era of scholarship. The Western Roman Empire became Christian in the early 4th century CE, but collapsed around 150 years later, leaving the Christian Church in possession of the most widespread network of power throughout Europe. Its scholarship was soon matched by that of a rising Eastern faith, Islam. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, a series of national histories written in Europe sought to discover, rediscover, or even invent the origins of the Germanic kingdoms that had inherited, that had inherited formerly Roman-occupied territory. Between the 8th and 10th centuries, the European record becomes rich with chronicles. At first, simply monks scribbled notes on ecclesiastical calendars. These became more elaborate accounts of whatever interested the author, from the creation onwards. Often a litany of fables, plagues, and disasters that cannot be relied upon as historical evidence. Almost all chronicles had their origins in the Christian Church, which, as virtually the sole fount of literacy at the time, had tight control on what books were written, copied, and circulated. Later in the Middle Ages, however, some chronicles escaped their ecclesiastical origins and religious bias to give a more rounded view of events. For example, Geoffrey of Villehardwain's account on, of the Fourth Crusade, the rise of Islam. The Islamic world of the 6th to 10th centuries experienced an era of expansion, political strength, and cultural creativity. Islamic scholars were keenly interested in establishing accurate biograph biographical information from the past, prompted by the need to determine which of the traditions about the life of the Prophet Muhammad and the first caliphs were accurate. It was Muslim scholars too, chiefly in the Abbasid capital of Baghdad, that preserved the works of many ancient Greek and Roman authors lost to Europe. The Islamic the Islamic historical tradition culminated in such great writers as Ibn Khaldun, a North African scholar whose monumental work, the Muqaddima, covered the whole of Islamic history and included aspects of social history and economics that European historians would investigate only some centuries later. The European Renaissance, from the 12th century, key classical texts such as those by the philosopher Aristotle and the medical writer Galen, started to return to Europe through Muslim-controlled Sicily and Spain. Soon yet more classical works became available. Some from the dwindling Greek-speaking territories of the Byzantine Empire. The pace of scholarly change in Europe quickened into a cultural flowering known as the Renaissance. A central preoccupation of Renaissance writers, artists, and scholars was the rediscovery of the past. The Roman era in particular was perceived as a time of scientific, literary, and artistic achievement.
the study of Roman history and historians became extremely popular, and writers such as Niccolo Machiavelli produced works such as The History of Florence, in imitation of their Roman ancestors. Renaissance authors wrote not only in Latin, but also in the vernacular, in the vernacular or everyday language, making their works much more accessible. New media. The spread of printing at this time dispersed new works more widely and also resulted in a wealth of printed primary sources for historians. Pamphlets, posters and news sheets were used to disseminate news and also to spread new ideas to a wider audience. For example, the distribution of printed material greatly assisted the success of the radical religious changes of the Reformation as it swept through Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. A new age of empire. The 18th and 19th centuries were a time of expansionism and empire, and much of our information about this era displays the bias of the empire builders. But it was also a time of revolution, with established power structures being questioned, challenged, and often overthrown. During the 18th century in Europe, religion gave ground to the human-centered ideology of the Enlightenment, and it is evident from the works of thinkers and writers how the scope of history and commentary widened. The Scottish economist Adam Smith included in his Wealth of Nations a new historical approach to the study of capitalism. The French philosopher Voltaire argued not only that social and economic history was just as important as the prevailing focus on political and diplomatic matters, but also that much could be learned by studying the histories of civilizations such as China and India. The philosophy of Romanticism found its way into history as Johann von Herder encouraged his fellow historians to feel their way inside historical cultures and, through empathizing, to really come to understand how they worked. Great Powers As European empires gathered power, other writers viewed national and imperial greatness as the pinnacle of human achievement. In Germany, historians began to concentrate on tracing the history of their nation, which was unified politically in 1871 to the, to the German Empire while the history of England, written by Baron Macaulay, detailed what he saw as the steady, virtually uninterrupted English ascendancy to greatness. Outside Europe, views of empire were at times similarly positive. In the view of the Indian writer Ghulam Hussein Tabatai, in his Siar al Mutakarin of 1781, the gradual British takeover of India was valuable in filling a power vacuum created by the decline of uh, Mughal power. In Japan, the Nihon Kaishi, unofficial history of Japan by Rai Sanyo, argued that domination by powerful military clans had been Japan's undoing and that power rightfully belonged to the emperor alone. This proposal influenced many of the leaders of the movement that restored imperial power to Japan in, eight, in 1868, the Meiji Restoration. Also a very interesting time period. I feel Japan's, I mean, a lot of Japan's history is interesting, but for me particularly, uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century is just, yeah, very fascinating. Um, but I'm also a little biased since 19th century is by far my, it's, it's kind of weird to say, favorite era in history but it's just something about it there's so many interesting events and developments and it's just it's just this in the span of a hundred years it just feels so there's something about it that just makes me want to learn more more so than any other you know defined time in history new sources the spread of literacy in this era, compared to previous centuries, has left historians a wider range of sources than just the views of the educated classes. There are revealing accounts, for example, made by common soldiers during 
during the Peninsular War campaign of 1808 to uh, 1814 of the Napoleonic Wars. Alex de Tocqueville um, wrote his history of the French Revolution, making use of first-hand accounts of events and a huge range of administrative documents, such as the Cahiers de Doléances um, list of grievances that the French Commune sent to the legislator in 1789. In the 19th century, the vastly increased availability of primary sources was complemented by new methods of recording events as they happened. The spread of photography from the 1830s made it possible for future historians to see what the past actually looked like. By the end of the 20th century, the first moving pictures and the first voice recordings had given us the possibility of an even more thrillingly direct insight into the past. History had come alive. Past, present and future. The revolutions and terrible wars of the 20th century profoundly affected people's views of their times and the histories that they wrote. The 21st century has continued to confront us with deeply shocking events on which we have yet to gain a full perspective. The revolution of 1917 that toppled the Russian Tsars had at its base a brand new ideology, Marxism. Karl Marx argued that history should be seen as a process by which societies develop through a series of stages, from ancient to feudal, then bourgeoisie, which would in turn be superseded by a communist society. Marx argued that there is an uncontrollable development from one stage to another, fueled by struggles between social classes over the ownership of wealth. In Marx's view, a violent social revolution was necessary to move from one phase to another. This is exactly what occurred in Russia in 1917, but it was not, as Marx predicted, repeated in the more industrialized countries of Europe, such as Germany. Marxism may have challenged modern historians to take a different view of history, but the advent of two world wars led to other major preoccupations. World Wars I and II devastated large parts of Europe and Asia and profoundly affected the political systems of large parts of the world. The sheer quantity of evidence available from a conflict such as World War II, from first-hand accounts to, pho uh, to photographs and films, appears to make the job of the historian disarmingly simple, but it has also become dauntingly complex in that there is so much information from every side of the conflict to be sifted through and compared. Instant access. At the beginning of the 21st century, technology has become so advanced that it gives us multiple records of major events. These are records that can all be accessed in an instant, through our television sets, personal computers, and now even our mobile phones. The development of the internet since the 1990s means that we can now capture, store, and transmit information at a speed that would have seen supernatural, that would have seemed supernatural only 200 years ago. Future perspectives. Access to information, as well as the first-hand accounts we can hear for ourselves from people who have made history, such as the veterans of World War II, can lull us into feeling as though somehow we know our recent history. However, just as the inquiries of the ancient Greeks were only the first step in producing a history, so our recordings and transcriptions of events in a modern world are simply contributions to an abundance of sources that we leave for the historians who will look back on the 20th and 21st centuries. Then, as ever, it will be how historians interpret their sources that makes history, not the sources themselves. Historians perpetually revisit the past, reassessing it in the light of updated social attitudes. In many cases, it is only with hindsight that we can focus fully on the causes and consequences of events. In years to come, our own ideas and biases may well be held up for scrutiny and perhaps disapproval by the historians of the future. And when these individuals ask not only what happened, but why did it happen, they may arrive at answers that are very different to those 
we may think we are so certain of today. That's gonna be it for tonight. I hope that this video was a relaxing experience for you and that you found something interesting in this chapter, which I, which I really do. I'm looking forward to continuing with this book, diving deeper into the different ages in history. Um, so, yeah. Good night. Thank you for watching.